Today is International Humanitarian Day, a time to honor people who have committed their lives to assisting others. Please understand that being a humanitarian doesn't require you to make a big commitment. A simple nice word or modest act can go a long way. Today, being humane means showing compassion for everyone, regardless of their history. And so, we will look at how one individual's life was changed simply by having someone standing in the gap. We'll also look at how the government is working to strengthen the public system, while also giving youngsters advice on how to improve their mental health. Don't go anywhere. We will be back after this. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Friday, August 19, 2022. Jamaica's economy continues to yield positive outcomes, growing by an estimated 5.7% during the April to June 2022 quarter, compared to the corresponding period last year. This was announced on Thursday by the Planning Institute of Jamaica, PIOJ. The growth was led by the services industry, for which all subsectors recorded higher outturns during the review period. It was enough to offset a 0.4% contraction in the goods producing industry. Director General Dr. Wayne Henry says the outturn largely reflects the impact of the removal of COVID-19 containment measures. Other factors which contributed to the improved outturn included, one, increases in hectares reaped, which facilitated growth in the agriculture industry. Two, continued improvement in the markets of Jamaica's main trading partners, that facilitated increased demand for industries such as hotels and restaurants, transport, storage and communication, and other services. And three, increased employment and consumer confidence, which supported higher levels of domestic demand. The highest services industry performer was hotels and restaurants, which grew by an estimated 55.4%. It reflects a sharp increase in visitor arrivals from Jamaica's main source markets. The goods producing industry's outturn largely resulted from an estimated 60.6% .6 decline in mining and quarrying due to a decline in alumina production. Conversely, agriculture, forestry and fishing grew by an estimated 12.6% and manufacturing by 2.8%. The PIOJ says the economy is estimated to have grown by 6.1% for the first six months of 2022, driven by a 8.1% growth in the services industry, while the goods producing industry remained flat. Meanwhile, the PIOJ is reporting that Jamaica's short-term economic prospects are positive, with growth anticipated to be within the range of 2-3% for the July to September quarter. PIOJ's Director General Dr. Wayne Henry also gave that update during the Institute's quarterly media briefing yesterday. Short-term prospects for the overall economy are positive, based on one, the continued economic recovery in most industries as operations gradually return to normalcy, two, strengthening of the global economy, which augurs well for external demand, three, improved labor market outturn is expected to bolster domestic demand and four, the gradual reopening of the Jamalka alumina plant, which will remove the drag on growth. Dr. Henry says this is expected to spur growth of between 3 and 5 percent for the overall 2022-23 fiscal year. He, however, cautions that the economy is not expected to attain pre-COVID GDP levels until the 2023-24 fiscal year. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett is reiterating the call for the implementation of a Caribbean visa regime to allow for ease of movement within the region. Minister Bartlett made the call while addressing a special meeting with a delegation from the Cayman Islands recently. He says the CARICOM visa introduced for World Cup cricket in the past, allowing players and the visitors to attend, can be tweaked and used today to boost tourism in the region. So we can have a Caribbean visa that will enable um, movements within the Caribbean um, for touristic purposes, for a short period, not, not, not for immigration purposes and migration. We, we, we're not about increasing your population. We're not about bringing people to live in their country and then to, to compete 
for the resources of your country. We're talking about adding value. Minister Bartlett also addressed the issue of border protocols and pre-clearance arrangements for visitors coming into the region. He says Jamaica is now looking at a convergence of the Northern Caribbean to strengthen relationships and enhance tourism. Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries Pernell Charles Jr. is leading Jamaica's delegation to the CARICOM Agri-Investment Forum and Expo 2 in Trinidad and Tobago. The event begins today and continues to August 21. Heads of government from the Caribbean community are meeting to discuss ways for the region to achieve food security and reduce the import bill by 25% by the year 2025. Minister Charles Jr.'s participation in the forum and expo is expected to further augment Jamaica's contribution to efforts already underway. Jamaica plays a critical role in that given the fact that we are 20% of that import bill. We have a very full schedule. We'll be making the most of this uh, to ensure that we advance discussions that will benefit Jamaica and benefit the region. Minister Charles Jr. will also represent Prime Minister Andrew Holness at the second meeting, where heads of government of CARICOM will discuss issues related to Haiti and other matters. Government has developed an online portal to streamline the application process for Jamaicans living overseas to acquire returning resident status. Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Leslie Campbell, made the disclosure at the recent annual Ecumenical Service of Thanksgiving to celebrate Jamaica's 60th anniversary of independence held at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta in the United States. He says persons can access the application form on the Jamaica Customs Agency's website at jacustoms.gov.jm. Minister Campbell says it is also now easier for persons to renew their passports through the Passport Immigration and Citizenship Agency's renewal system at pica.gov.jm. Once the process is completed, applicants may opt for their passport to be delivered to them in the United States. And finally, persons who want to participate in this year's game bird hunting season are being reminded that they must obtain a hunting license from the National Environment and Planning Agency, NEPA. Hunting licenses can be obtained at NEPA's head office at 10 Caledonia Avenue in Kingston or any of the authorized vendors located across the island. The 2022 game bird hunting season is open from August 20 to September 25. Under the Wildlife Protection Game Birds Declaration of Shooting Season, Order 2022, the season's hunting sessions are from sunrise to 9 a.m. and 2.30 to sunset on Saturdays and from sunrise to 9 a.m. on Sundays. During the season, the morning dove commonly called the long-tailed pea dove, the white-winged dove, the zanada dove, also known as pea dove, and the white-crowned pigeon, also called bald pate, may be hunted. The overall bag limit per hunting session is 20 birds, no more than 15 of which can be white-crowned pigeons. Hunting is prohibited within game reserves or sanctuaries, forest reserves, the Blue and Jonkro Mountains National Park, and within 50 meters of their boundaries. The cost for a hunting license is $25,000, and all applicants must have a valid firearm license or user's permit for a shotgun, as well as a TRN. Hunters are reminded that hunting reports not completed and returned by December 31 of the same year of the season will attract a late processing fee of $5,000, which must be paid before a hunter's license for the next season can be granted. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. Everybody's life has the potential to alter in a split second, and frequently we need assistance from others to help us get back on course. Let's find out how a Good Samaritan's assistance improved one man's seemingly hopeless situation. Growing up, you know, I, I didn't have no parent, no, nowhere to go. I was just stranded. I started to live in crossroads because I didn't have nowhere else to go. So 
what I would do when I'm at Crossroad, I would stay in Mother's by day and by night I would get a piece of cardboard and sleep at the bus stop beside of uh, Mother's in Crossroad. I will walk and beg or I will stay in Mother's for the whole day, um, begging passbys or so forth till I find myself again a money now. So I'd always have a phone, so I use um, that money that I get, buy credit, put on the phone and put on service, you know, data and um, find out about all of the ministries and so forth and I will sit there and call the different ministries from the, the chief of defense staff office to the minister, minister of education, the minister, prime minister's office, all of those. So I keep on calling and keep on calling till I call the Prime Minister's office again and a secretary. I talk to her till I tell myself, say, me, 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 me can't take it no more. I start crying and I tell the lady, say, Miss, please just help me. Please, me, I beg you, help me. And the lady say, Young man, I will guarantee you that I will help you. So don't worry yourself. She came back like an hour after her support and she said to me that I got to a person that I think will most likely help you in your situation, which his name is Mr. Martin Rittman. He is the head coordinator of the OPE program. An hour after, Mr. Rittman called me and he introduced himself and I introduced myself and I tell him my story all over again. He told me that he can help me out with something to do, a skill and a job or so, so I can gain some form of income. So I could buy hygiene products and clothes and so forth. So he directed me to the Art and Ripon Road where he told me to bring all docu relevant documents like ID, TR and so forth to that place on Ripon Road and speak to the secretary and tell her that Martin Rittman, the head coordinator of the O program, sent me here. He told me that I should go to a school that's on South Camp, um, UA Open Campus. I went for two weeks. After the two weeks, I spent at um, UA Open Campus at South Camp Road. I then moved on to a government agency for work. I started off um, processing in the computer all documents that come in. I will be the one who to lodge it in the computer and send it off to the dip different departments. But now I'm a, I'm a customer service rep at the moment because my supervisor told me that my talent is wasted where I'm at right now. I don't do much more than lodge the documents in the system and so forth. So she gave me more hands-on training that would more fit my character. I think it is a good motivator in the sense that, you know, it gives them some purpose of living, you know, coming, doing something, knowing that he's responsible for something that is such a vital aspect of the, our daily activities. He dresses well, always on time, and he, he takes pride in whatever, you know, what is assigned to him. Meaning, he works really hard, and whenever he's not here, they miss him. This particular day now, um, I think it's the following week after Martin Rittman helped me out with the O program and so forth, I saw a lady, just a random lady, I was begging and so forth. And the lady, Simeon, she started to talk to me and ask me, why am I here and so forth. So I told her and I spoke with her and she take me into mother's, she buy me a patty and a juice and we were talking, just talking and talking and then she asked me, do I want to come to stay with her? With a glad um, face, I accepted and said, yes, I would love to come home with you. When she took me in, it's like, you know, I was very welcome because just looking, I had a bed to sleep in that used to be a cardboard. I had food to eat that 
used to be me begging on the street just to make ends meet, just to eat a little patty or something. A uh, dumpling, uh, she gave me all type of food that I long to eat from a longer while. You know the reason why I do it? God himself provide for me. That's me can feed myself, feed him, feed my two grandchildren then. Helping him is not a problem. Helping somebody when they are in need is the greatest thing for me. I can put my life like the Titanic, if you've ever seen that movie. It's like, you know, when the ship was sinking, there's a lot of persons like, them don't know what to do. Some people just jump off in the water because them can't, but I was there and like, the ship has sink and it's like I tell myself, say, you know what, I'm not going to make this ship sink with me now. So, I decide to just jump off. So when you jump off now, I decide to say, you know what, I nah give up, I nah just drown so, I nah just go down so. So I tell myself, say, you know what, I go swim. Till I see a light and that light was Martin Rickman who shined a lot of other lights for me to a lot of different islands, a lot of different places. Effective leadership communicates effectively, has a clear vision and purpose, and motivates others to give their all. Our next feature will give you a chance to gain an exclusive insight into the mind of a leader in the Ministry of Finance who is dedicated to creating a better public sector. What are your morning rituals? Well, my personal devotion or prayers with the family and coffee. In one sentence, tell us what you do. Well, as the Commission of Revenue Appeals for the Division of the Ministry of Finance, I lead a team that is mandated by law to provide appeals mechanism for taxpayers to settle disputes that may arise from time to time between them and the Revenue Commissioners. What was the most difficult decision for you this week and why was it difficult? Well, this week I had to make a people management decision that did not sit well with the rest of the team. It was difficult because um, it appears as if the decision was causing some people to get what they desire, which undeservedly so, but it was the right decision for the rest of the team. It was in the best interest of the team. Good morning, Stacy. Good morning, Virginia. Any messages for me? Currently. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Has anyone or anything made you feel inspired lately? Yes. I firmly believe I work with the best team. The, their attitudinal response to the corporate vision is just inspiring. And the way they responded, particularly over the last quarter of the last fiscal year, to get us over the proverbial line was just inspiring. What would you like your legacy to be in the public sector? I learned early in my life that I'm limited by what I think and believe about myself. And so with that knowledge, I have vowed to always keep an open mind and to push the boundaries. I've led my team that way and my legacy will be persons, leaving persons behind who are that open-minded and always ready to, to test the orthodoxy. Where's the most interesting place your work has taken you? Hmm. That would have to be India. I visited India in 2000 where I learned about customs valuation. It was a very thrilling experience. I love the food and the culture and just the atmosphere there. I would love to revisit that place one day. And before we go, can you recommend one book you think everyone should read? 
One book will be difficult, and so I have two. For your spiritual life, The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, and for your professional life, The Forgotten Half of Change by Luke de Berbandere. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner. Have a wonderful day. Thank you too, and you too. Slow down. Give yourself permission to take it easy. Helping yourself is a prerequisite for helping others. Can one pour from an empty cup? This brings me to our mental health. Our psychological, emotional, and social well-being all fall under the category of mental health. Starting from a place of mental wellness will enable freedom of the mind and the capacity to give back. And this is what the government is working on with today's youth. Let's take a look. Good health, especially our mental health, is an important factor to achieving success. And so, taking care of our body, particularly our brain, which regulates how we function, is key. It's how we think, it's how we feel, it's how we navigate and how we connect with each other and how we function, right? And when we're mentally well, it means that we can grow, it means that we can flourish, it means that we can achieve the goals that we've set out to achieve. Mental wellness is one of the four dimensions of health, the others being the spiritual, physical, and the social. They all feed into achieving stability. We talk about in, in terms of mental healthness, it's, ta it's feeling balanced, right? It's being able to think and it's being able to function well. The fact is, the ebbs and flow of life are normal and so understanding and applying coping methods is paramount. It is said that this is the foundation on which character is made. So ask for help when needed, maintain positive relationships, and take control of the situation. More later. The COVID-19 pandemic has created challenges within the mental realm for many persons, and the Ministry of Health and Wellness, having assessed the impact, has crafted a national program of response. So this program is intended on bringing the experts together and to just help us to readjust back to the normal life that we used to because COVID has been devastating on us. Some people call it mental health, we call it mental wellness. Because we're not promoting the negative, we're promoting the positive. We are saying that your state of mind should be positive about life. The program, spearheaded by psychiatrist Dr. Sophia Longmore, seeks to promote a better understanding and acceptance of mental well-being with special attention being paid to children in schools exhibiting deviant behavior. It evaluates root causes and provides psychosocial support. The need is great for mental wellness in our society at this time. And my role in the Senate, in the Upper House of Parliament, along with being a psychiatrist and president of the Jamaica Psychiatric Association, kind of made it such where I could help to make this happen. So this is a collaboration between the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the Ministry of Education and Youth, the Jamaica Psychiatric Association, and the Jamaica Psychological Association. It's a national program that we're doing, but we are starting with where we think the need and the impact is greatest at this time. Our youth have been negatively impacted by COVID-19, with some reporting to be overly stressed from the lack of face-to-face -face interaction and tactile in-classroom learning experience for over two years. Having to adjust to when the call came in for in-person sessions has added to mental angst. It is okay that you didn't forget some of the study techniques. What we have to do now is to learn to re-engage. Learn now to live as a young person again. To enjoy your education experience. Enjoy your friends. Enjoy your classroom setting and your teacher. And don't make anything bother you so much that you sit down by yourself in loneliness, fear, and anxiety. We're saying that no matter how you feel, depressed, are lonely, are anxious, are uncertain. 
no matter how much the work is giving you trouble or your circumstances at home may be a little problematic, we are saying that we are here for you. There's someone you can come talk to and there are ways to overcome all of that. The intervention, which began in June, targets schools across the island with face-to-face -face and virtual sessions and provides support for school administrators to cope with the challenges. The expert counsel from these sessions provides an appreciation of the concepts and techniques of mental wellness that we could all use as part of our coping mechanism. When we speak about mental health, right, how do we ensure as young people that our mental health is appropriately addressed? Well, one, we, it's important for us to identify, identify what makes us happy, what's our strengths, and also to identify what's our sources of stress. So for example, if you know there's a particular friend group, right, that brings you joy, that brings you happiness, so guess what, know your tribe, know your group that feeds you and feeds your energy. If there's another group or an environment that every time you go there you feel nervous, you feel anxious, you don't want to be there, identify your source of, of stress and stressors. So if you know that, what do you do then? If you know there's a group or an environment that's not really sitting with your soul and your spirit, distance yourself because you don't need that, right? The Faculty of Applied Science, Engineering and Technology, we are on a mandate. We are pushing to utilize science with agriculture. And so we have some new programs that are being offered, particularly um, bachelors in agricultural engineering and a bachelors in electronics and computing. We also have a bachelors in biological sciences and one in food analysis and quality. Some encouraging persons, wherever you are, to sign up. We, you're, they, all that is required is for five, six seats um, with the sciences that will actually line up with the particular major that you want to. And we are ready to have you. We've come to the end of our program. Get a recap of all you saw here and more on our website at www.gis.gov.jm. From all of us here at the GIS, I'm Audrey Williams. Bye for now. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.